Um, so yeah, so as Marco said, the um, so the, the the talking I'm giving today is very much the uh, results of myself, but also my uh, colleagues here within the Shimoda Marine Research Center, as well as with uh, far too many collaborators to list. Now, going. So obviously the uh, ICONA project that we're having the kickoff symposium for today um, is a brand new project that we actually only started in April of this year. Um, it was initiated from the, uh, the Japanese side as part of a Japan Society for the Promotion of Sciences project. Um, but this is of course something which we're looking to, to grow. And so, uh, you know, we've started the project with, uh, you know, some of our long lasting collaborators um, but of course, we are hoping to include as many sort of CO2 seeps, natural analogs, and just OA researchers as we can. Um, so obviously, I saw some uh, some wonderful comments from uh, some Nuria and Marco and uh, Maria from uh, Ischia. Um, and uh, you know, the, the comments I'm making share exactly the sentiment we're hoping to get across. You know, we want this to be a very collaborative network where we can get as many people as possible involved. Um, so that we can just make these uh, systems as usable and useful as possible to try and understand some of the more um, general patterns of how ocean acidification is going to be impacting our oceans. So we have a number of sites, but hopefully more to come. So one of the things that's obviously been very well established across other um, anthropogenic climate change aspects is the potential for communities and ecosystems to undergo regime shifts. So very dramatic and abrupt changes in the system, which have therefore implications on the community and the functioning of them. Now, a very common occurrence we're coming across is that more and more systems seem to be shifting to turf algae. And some of the mechanisms which this comes about are obviously could be very easily driven by ocean acidification as well. We have concerns about these because they can represent a loss of habitat and structural complexity and potentially have implications for biodiversity and functioning. And obviously, ocean acidification research has been going on for a good many years now, and we have some of the generalizations coming out that, of course, we know that some calcifying organisms are very negatively impacted and some primary producing species are boosted. But it's this kind of imbalance in the responses where some can be both stressed or boosted in terms of uh, OA being a resource. And that makes it more and more likely that when we consider the communities, that um, they may be reshuffled or reorganized. And so it makes it quite difficult for our predictions. So you obviously heard some of the, the talks from the other presenters um, showing their seats. So the seat that I most predominantly use, along with my colleagues, is on Shkine Island. So this is a um, volcanic island about two hours off the uh, main island of Japan. And it's located within the biogeographic boundary between temperate and subtropical communities. Now, within the site, we predominantly have two areas we work in. So we have our control area up in the top, um, which is indicated as a sort of around 300 parts per million. And we have our acidified area that's at 900 parts per million. From some of the sort of reasonably longer term pH monitoring, we know that these conditions are quite stable. And so these give us a nice large area, sort of you know, around a hectare or something like this, for us to look at and uh, carry out our experiments. Now, the 300 parts per million may seem a little bit low to uh, those of you familiar with carbonate chemistry, but we actually have, we're under the influence of the Curacao current, which seems to draw down the CO2. And so that's actually very um, sort of realistic and what we would expect for the area. So when we start to consider the actual sort of biology and ecology of uh, Shikine Island, what we have is in the control areas, it has very high biodiversity and complexity. Now, as I previously mentioned, we're located within the biogeographic boundary between tropical, uh, subtropical and temperate. And so in our control conditions, we actually have both corals and macroalgae kind of coexisting. Now, when we go into the high CO2 areas, the, uh, a lot of these species then give way and very much become dominated by a turf algae instead. So using a series of transects, we actually assessed uh, how these uh, sort of main habitat forming species changed. 
And we found that the corals dropped off very quickly in terms of the cover after only a very short drop within pH. With turf, we found that it increasingly um, became more abundant and dominant as the pH dropped, whereas the other macroalgae went in a kind of mirror opposite. And so overall, what this means is that ocean acidification is causing some regime shifts and a general habitat loss towards turf dominated system. Now, so what my research is particularly interested in understanding is how is it that this regime shift has come about? And you know, how is the community altered? And how is it that such a simple system is actually able to kind of remain within place? And so we've carried out a number of experiments within our control site. So obviously representing present day and our site within the CO2C representing the future ocean acidification. So one of the first kind of theories or hypotheses we had was we wondered whether the communities during their development and succession just simply diverged. And so we wanted to look into this by using some recruitment tiles. So we did this on a couple of different temporal scales. So the first one was a shorter term experiment using some perspex plates. So we could look at how the kind of very early stage community developed. And then a longer term experiment that was carried out over about a two year period with some sampling points in between. And we could then use some metric barcoding approaches to assess the diversity of the community at these different stages to try and understand how the community composition was being affected. And what you can see on the video is just an example of when we were collecting some of these recruitment tiles after about a year. So you can see we get you know, quite a good growth in that period, but particularly that you have this very distinct community in the two sites with a very turf dominant uh, system within the high CO2. So on that experiment with the recruitment tiles in the short term, we had uh, some work carried out by Ro Allen, who at the time was a PhD student in uh, University of Otago in New Zealand. And so he was interested in looking at the prokaryotic so, and the eukaryotic communities. And what he generally found was that at the different time points, so after five days, 10, 15, and 21, that you had this very clear separation between the two sites, so the reference and the high CO2. And that you actually also had quite a clear direction as well when you're talking about the development. So we could see that with time, the communities developed, but in the two different uh, sort of CO2 conditions, they were very much diverged in, in a sort of a separate pattern. When we started to look into the longer term, we had exactly the same thing. So we had, again, we had this clear separation in the community composition between the prokaryotes and here the fauna, where the fauna was indicated by uh, 18S. And so overall, this kind of suggests that at the very least from the five day point up to at least two years, the community seemed to diverge and then remain diverged rather than being some sort of subset with the sense of species lost. Now, as well as obviously being interested in the community itself, we're actually interested in the associated functioning. And so with another kind of short-term um, recruitment experiment, but actually different to the one did by four by my uh, colleague Wadasan, he was interested in understanding how the net photosynthesis was affected between these two sites. And one of the things he found was that in these very early stages, that you actually had a very high productive system. So this is within the sort of biofilm stages. And it actually had really great productivity that was maintained up to about uh, two and a half months. But when we then used those longer term tiles in the experiment, we actually found that this didn't seem to be maintained. So here we've got the gross, so it's, it is different to the net productivity. So the gross primary production, we found that the reference tiles would increase their prime production over time as the community continued to develop. And very similarly, you would have the community respiration associated with this. So the various um, sessile and sort of motile fauna showed greater respiration. Whereas when you think about the high CO2 community, they were generally quite similar at two months as they were to sort of 18 or 24. And overall, this kind of uh, visually was just shown by the fact that the communities didn't really seem to develop too much after they reached a certain stage and that they were almost locked in. So we we're kind of interested in some of the mechanisms associated with this. And so we wanted to know, is it just when you have 
a bare substrate and that initial community succession, is this the only time in which the communities were diverged? Or if you had an existing community, would it do a similar thing? And so we carried out a reciprocal transplant where we let some tiles grow for about six months, and then we swapped them into uh, an alternative site or within the same one to see how the communities would then respond. And so in this graph here, you have the dashed lines indicate the six months with the solid lines indicating the 12 months. And so what we could see was that tiles that had been always sort of recruiting and grown in the control were actually really quite similar to the ones that have been in the OA for six months and then within the control. And very similarly, within the high CO2, even if they'd grown the six, first six months in the control, they then became very, very similar. So this kind of represents a couple important facts. Firstly, that the development sort of trajectory can be affected by the conditions you're currently in and that you're not kind of locked into one path. You're very much determined by the uh, conditions you're experiencing, but also that there has to be some other interactions and feedback loops going on that are actually driving these communities to go that the way they are. So when we looked within the high CO2 area of Shikine, we actually, one of the first things we observed within the turf algae was that it was trapping large amounts of sediment. Now this is very common for turf algae, but one of the additional things we noticed was that when you actually moved away that top layer of turf, the sediment actually had a kind of a black and dark coloration. Now this is very typical of hypoxic or anoxic conditions. And so we wanted to do some in situ measurements um, in situ measurements of the water chemistry. And so using just a, a syringe whilst diving, we took some water samples uh, within the sediment below the turf, within the turf algae itself, at the surface interface between the turf algae and the seawater and uh, a couple meters above. And then we measured this water sample for pH dissolved oxygen and carbonate saturation state. And what we could see is that despite this um, sort of range in scale being only about 10 centimeters, you saw large changes in the seawater carbonate chemistry when you went into the turf algae and the sediment. And that in particular, the pH decline within the sediment was far greater than we would expect by the end of the century. The dissolved oxygen was actually approaching hypoxia and we actually showed a sort of passive dissolution based on the aragonite saturation state, i.e. the fact that it was below one. Now, overall, this is an area that's normally actually a sort of like a rock surface. And so this is what everything is recruiting onto, whether it be the algae or the corals, because they're a community, not a reef. And so, but they're having this presence of turf and sediment. It's instead making the conditions particularly adverse for anything looking to recruit in. And so we thought it's obviously likely to have implications in that part. So we wanted to understand how it was that this altered chemistry was coming about. So we also did some uh, meta barcoding of the bacterial communities within the turf and within the sediment to see if we could try and understand some of this mechanism. And what we found was that the bacterial community within the sediment greatly differed from the turf and that within it, it had a great domination by some delta proteobacteria and epsilon bacteriota that are very typical of hypoxic or anoxic conditions because of their sulfate reducing and sulfur oxidizing um, characteristics. Now, what we kind of then hypothesized was that you therefore had the dissolved oxygen, pH, and saturation state being driven down by this very active heterotrophic bacterium and its respiration. And that this was able to be fueled by just the large amount of the photosynthetic exudates from the turf algae itself that would just allow it to just continually kind of uh, cycle around. And so we kind of like, understood how the changes in the microchemical environment came about. So we want to understand and actually test how this will impact recruitment. And so we put a number of uh, recruitment tiles, so small uh, PVC uh, tiles out all within the high CO2. And we placed them within areas that seem to get sort of usually a little bit more turf than others, and then kind of looked afterwards and then assessed the recruitment, depending on whether there would have been lots of turf covering them, a little bit of turf, or no turf at all. And the pattern pretty much followed exactly what we'd hypothesized, whereby the presence of the turf algae and the sediment 
was just inhibiting the recruitment of any other macroalgae. In particular, coralline algae, which in the absence of turf were able to recruit in the high CO2, but increasingly declined in their recruitment. Now this was a recruitment over about a four month period. So this meant that we kind of knew that the habitat was being affected by ocean acidification and that was, there were some feedback loops and interactions going on that were kind of locking it in place and bringing about this regime shift. But in addition to the actual change in the habitat, this can have knock on effects on sort of the other sort of higher trophic organisms. And so some work that was uh, particularly led by uh, Carlo Catano and uh, Marco Milazzo, so from the Italian team, they found that you actually had, as the habitat declined with the increasing PCO2 in Shikine, you had changes in both the diversity of fish, but also within their fish traits. And that generally, as you lost lots of the habitat in the area, particularly the corals and other sort of tropical associated habitat, the tropical fish declined. And so we had within the high CO2, much more temperate fish and much more herbivores, and therefore obviously fewer tropical fish. And so therefore one of the other sort of interesting aspects we've been looking into is the fact that there may be a interaction with how ocean acidification may actually oppose the poleward shift of tropical fish by having impacts upon their habitat. And so we actually have a really interesting system uh, where we're based, and which is the fact that on the map here, the OW and OAW is the Shikine site, so the, the control and the high CO2 I've been talking about. But where the map indicates present is actually where our main um, marine research center is located. And despite this only being about 50 kilometers or so, because of the influence of the Kuroshio current, we actually have kelp forests in the bay in front of our center. And then all of this is sort of given away, or given way uh, within Shikine. But it, as recently as about 20 years ago, there used to be kelp forests within Shikine. And so we know that it's therefore become very recently tropicalized. And so we can make comparisons using Shimoda as the kind of present uh, location, the control in Shikine as an ocean warming, and the seep as the ocean warming and acidification. Now, this is work that is predominantly led by my colleague, Silvan. And so one of the things he first found was that when he carried out a transplant of kelp into the area to try and understand why it was that they were no longer present, the transplants had absolutely zero survival in Shikine Island, whether the control or the seep. And so we're kind of a little bit perplexed by this. And so he carried out some additional transplants, but put out a camera. And he found that huge numbers of the parrotfish, so Coptos ponicus, would come in and just decimate the kelp as soon as it was put in, usually within a number of hours of them being placed out. And so what this suggests is that the kelp loss is predominantly associated with the grazing of the fish, so the presence of subtropical fish. And so it may be more of an indirect impact of warming rather than necessarily a direct impact of warming. So we know that with the kelp, that was kind of how they were being impacted. With the corals, we actually did uh, some transplants with two different coral species. So I'm just going to show the results with the uh, Acropora. So Acropora, very much a subtropical coral species. And we found that when it was located within the present day conditions, the winter periods would often be a little bit too cold for it. So it didn't really like it. And so when you had it within the warming conditions, that's where it kind of showed its greatest growth. So, but when you had that species within the ocean acidification section, which has the same temperature as the control, we saw much more declines within the growth, suggesting that although coral growth may be boosted in warm conditions, it's actually likely to decline with ocean acidification, even when combined. And so overall, this therefore has implications for the role of ocean acidification in future tropicalization, because if we have our existing temperate communities which include sort of typically kelp dominated. And if you have warming, then they may become coral dominated because this is the kind of traditional uh, view of tropicalization, because there is a bonus to the growth of the corals. The kelp, unfortunately, are lost because of the fish herbivory, 
But the problem becomes that when you actually consider both the acidification and the warming, you lose out on both of the main habitat forming species, but kind of each to the different driver. And so you no longer have the coral and you no longer have the kelp. And so it's likely that you instead exhibit a simplification where you're left with just a sort of turf dominated system and only the uh, species associated with that. Now, obviously this work that I've been using um, up to this point has been focused on Shkine, but obviously a large part of this project is about collaborative work and starting to try and get more general patterns um, so to cut, almost overcome the idios idiosyncrasies of a particular site and try and expand. And this is what we're hoping to do. Now, there is therefore the um, greater importance of starting to use multiple CO2 seeps. And this is what we're starting to do. So this was some work led by uh, Viviana Benna. And she was very interested in looking into how the taxonomy of coralline algae is affected by OA. So these were some uh, samples carried out in both Shikine, but also in uh, Volcano Island in Italy. And there was two very interesting things that she found with her research. Firstly, that there was far greater diversity than was previously expected, whereby we'd actually found many, many species where they mostly weren't actually in the gen bank, um, like a bank. And so we actually found that because we'd effectively previously underestimated the diversity, the loss of diversity under OA was far greater than had been um, previously thought. So we're potentially underestimating this loss. And very similarly, we have some other work that again was led by uh, Silvan, in which we did some work combining between Shkine Island and Papua New Guinea, in which we started to try and look into some of the differences in the physiological traits of corals. Again, by trying to focus on more of those kind of underlying and general patterns rather than completely species specific. And so he carried out uh, a number of uh, experiments and transplants to either trying to compare those species that were deemed to be winning, so those that were commonly found in both the control and high CO2, and those that were deemed to be losing species because they were already found to have been lost in the seep, so only found in the control. And so one of the things that uh, he found was that the traits of the winners generally seemed to be that they had higher mitochondrial energy production and generally lower biomass, and that the losers didn't, couldn't really acquire these same traits. So even after um, sort of short-term transplants or even like longer-term sort of adaptation or where, you know, selection where they're actually found in the seeps, they couldn't seem to get these same traits. And so there was kind of almost a locked in. But what this means is, is that it's becoming increasingly important to synthesize across multiple areas and species to try and understand some of these sort of underlying physiological or molecular traits. So to sort of bring this in summary, overall, it seems to suggest that with ocean acidification, we're experiencing this very widespread and global loss in the structural complexity as we start to lose some of the key habitat formers um, and have them sort of shift to turf algae. Um, we have some concerns that this may, uh, loss in diversity in habitat may have implications for the associated functioning and that there are a number of important indirect uh, interactions and feedback loops uh, that may be playing a role and may actually uh, lock some of these systems in place, making their recovery far more difficult. Um, so I just leave it there, just listed there to some of the, uh, the papers I've spoken about today, if you are interested. Um, so, but first and mostly, thank you for listening. I'll take any questions.